not just here, but the entire country, no, is that every single bureaucracy on. is not on the side of the students, but on the side of the Zionists who are literally killing thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Palestinians day in and day out while profiting. What needs to be done to end this genocide is like we've been saying for hours on end, it's one solution, revolution. And in order to have that, we must globalize the Intifada. Student activists have escalated the Palestine Solidarity Movement significantly over the past week, establishing encampments at campuses across the country. This kind of escalation is exactly what the movement needed. It's clear to all that Biden and Netanyahu will press on with their genocidal war at all costs, and that we need to take matters into our own hands. In this podcast, we're going to offer our proposals for how we can collectively escalate the movement further. We're going to hear from comrades that are actually on the ground trying to do this. We're going to hear from comrades on the editorial board of The Communist, like Tom Trottier, Bryce Gordon. But first, we're going to hear from Antonio Balmer, the managing editor of The Communist. The current wave of campus occupations, these Gaza solidarity encampments that we are seeing on universities across the country, represents a new stage in the movement. After nearly seven months, of marches, demonstrations, chanting, demands for a ceasefire, demands for some slowing down of this shipment of arms to Israel to fund this genocide that just keeps killing and killing. It has had zero effect. A lot of people have been asking themselves for a while now, what is it going to take? What is next for the movement? One more demand to shut it down for Palestine. It's not having an effect. Well, now we have a new expression of that. A new answer is being given in practice, mass action. You know, after months of putting forward this slogan, there is only one solution, intifada revolution. Think about what an intifada represents. It's not just a spontaneous mass uprising. It's an explosion of working class coordination. It's a direct action move to collectively take matters into our own hands. It's workers dividing up among themselves in an ingenious way, a division of labor to take society's functions into their hands. We now have a glimpse of that, a concrete step in that direction in these campus occupations. This demand around divestment is something we should look at very carefully because for a long time that demand has been put forward in an abstract way by middle class liberal activists who have been appealing to the moral responsibility of corporations to put their mouth to, to put their money where their mouth is when they say they represent humanitarian values it's an appeal to have civic responsibility to not invest in this brutal occupation this brutalization of the of the palestinians corporations don't have morals they have shareholders they have marketing strategies they have naked class interests you don't get anywhere by appealing to those morals but this is different this demand for divestment is not just an appeal to the campus administrations. We know that we're not appealing to the campus presidents. These are just more corporations, by the way. They may be called nonprofit corporations, but these private universities are just fattening their endowments. They're using finance capital. They're making investments. We know that there's money, that there's blood on, on that money, but we are not appealing to them. We know that we're not appealing to the president of Colombia, who a couple of weeks ago was addressing Congress, branding the whole movement as anti-Semitic, slandering it, in, in front of the, the the House of Representatives. We know that we're not appealing to the administration of the University of Southern California that canceled the valedictorian speech because they knew that she was going to speak in favor of the Palestinian people against this genocide. Or are we appealing to the president of the University of Texas at Austin, who's texting the senator saying, we need reinforcements. We don't have enough security to put down this group of peaceful demonstrators. The the senator is only so happy to oblige. The governor gets on national TV and says every protester deserves to be in prison, that they should, they're all anti-Semitic. They bring in police 
riot cops mounted on horses with tear gas, indiscriminately brutalizing students, punching them in the face, dragging them over chain link fences, arresting people just for being at the front of the crowd. Are we appealing to, to that administration to do the right thing? Are we appealing to the administration of the University of Indiana that recently called for police reinforcements to have police deployed on the top of the Memorial Union building, snipers with their rifles pointed at these peaceful pro protesters? Are we appealing to those people? I think the movement is clear. We are not appealing to them. So this call for divestment, this call that says we don't want our tens of thousands of dollars of tuition money to be going toward Israel is a completely correct demand. We don't want that. But guess what? We don't trust the administrators to shift things. They are actually complicit in this genocide. They've been profiting from it the whole time. Their only concern is to have a quiet end of the semester. And that's why they're hoping that by bringing in the full force of state repression, that they can silence the students. And now it's backfiring because this is only spreading. But we know that we're not appealing on them. This is class struggle. This is taking matters into our own hands. Why should those university administrators, these presidents, these boards of directors, why should they be the ones who control what happens with the money? Why should they be the ones who control the campuses? Why, because they have a line to the senator and they can deploy the police forces? Is that why? Or is it because they have six-figure salaries and a title that says that they are the administration of the school? Or should the control be exercised by the students who are actually paying the tuition that makes the whole thing funded? Should it be exercised by the teachers, by the faculty, by the campus workers that make the actual campus run? What would a university be without all of those people? It's not the administrators that make the university. The control of the campus should be in the hands of the students, the faculty, the adjuncts, the campus workers. This occupation poses that question. It's a step in that direction. The communists should help everyone understand what the next steps are. That's the question that's being posed because you need organization. You can't just spontaneously start to occupy and hope that we end up seizing control of this campus. Those presidents should all be dismissed. The boards of directors should all go, all of them. They should all go. They've all forfeited their responsibility, their justification for running these institutions of higher learning. They should be moved out of, of their, of their uh, offices. And in their place, we should set up a new board of directors that is controlled one third by the faculty and campus workers, one third by the students on the university, and one third by the broader representatives of the working class. You could have representatives of the faculty unions across the country, delegates that are elected by the encampments that are now spreading from coast to coast. You could have a board of directors that makes decisions that opens up the books, not just calling on them to have transparency, not just calling on them to report about the money and then they handle it behind closed doors. We should open the books ourselves. These new workers boards of directors should have control over the accounting. Where is the money going? Make the decisions directly. We need to have workers control of the campuses. That is where this struggle could go. That is the way to have a class war path forward for this movement. That is what the communists need to be bringing into it. But the campuses, they are an opportunity to begin this action. They've already begun the action. It's on the headlines. The world is seeing it. The, the, the example is spreading to campuses around the world. But the strategic sectors of the working class, when it comes to stopping the supply of arms, are not just campus workers. It's not just the students. Our campus occupations are not going to be enough to stop the shipments from going. If U.S. arms stop arriving in Israel, the genocide will come to a halt. They do not have enough to supply this, to continue this on, on their own. This all re relies on U.S. shipments that are coming. They're all being manufactured in the United States. There are tens, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of workers who are involved directly in the various components in the supply chain of the ammunitions, of the fighter jets of all of the weapons and all of their components, of the drones, everything that's being sent to Israel to carry out these atrocities are being produced on assembly lines in the United States in front of U.S. workers. They're being shipped in U.S. trucks to ports, to U.S. ports where you have workers who are loading these ships. This is all happening in the hands of the working class. If the working class disrupts 
any particular point of that supply chain, the whole thing will come to a grinding halt. That is the power of the working class. So it's not just the campuses. How do we link the two? If we get organized in the encampments, if we have general assemblies, a formalized structure to debate, to come to decisions, to elect delegates, democratically select our representatives, select spokespeople to speak to the public, deploy groups of representatives from the encampment to go to these workers, to go to different workplaces, to address the broader labor movement, to make an appeal of solidarity directly from the ground zero of the campus encampments, that is where you can start to have a broader uh, expansion into the, the class struggle. That is what's needed. The University of Southern California in LA, that campus in downtown LA, could select and deploy a group of agitators to go and talk to the longshore workers and get a statement of solidarity. There are campus campuses that could do the same thing to workers uh, and to reach out to the broader labor movement in all of its different industries. NYU workers are organized in the United Auto Workers. That leader, Sean Fain, has come out and said, I am a fighter. Sean Fain has led a strike in the last period, has made a statement calling for a ceasefire. Sean Fain, your workers see you as a fighter. You know, you have an entire generation of young people supporting what you're doing in your efforts to organize the unorganized, to go after these unorganized auto plants, to bring the fight into industry. We have, we're supporting what you're, what you're doing. You understand young people support the unions overwhelmingly. Do you support what the youth are doing? When you say you, you stand for a ceasefire and you see young people actually trying to achieve it because Joe Biden, genocide Joe, has done nothing to achieve that result. Do you realize that workers have to take this into our own hands? Do you support this? And if you do, you should mobilize the United Auto Workers from coast to coast in solidarity. The faculty at University of Texas, Austin, have come out in support of the students. They've come out in support of the occupation. They have said after seeing the way the administration deployed and brutalized these, these students that were peacefully gathered to, to voice their views, they saw this brutal repression and they're standing against it. They said, tomorrow, no grading, no classes. We're going to assemble on the main hall. This is the way forward, standing with the students. Those faculty should be invited to become an integral part of the encampment. And the same thing should be replicated on every campus from coast to coast. Bring the faculty in. You need them. The students and the faculty need to work together to seize control of these campuses. Because we're bringing democratic workers control of these campuses. We can only do it together. This is also a key for reaching to those broader layers of the working class. You can send delegations of students, but if you have a statement formally on behalf of these unionized workers on the campuses calling for class solidarity from the broader working class, this can help to show this is the way forward. After all, a lot of these workers, you know, there's, there's the workers in the strategic industries, in the armaments, workers who are living in rural parts of the country. The ruling class is hoping that those workers will keep their heads down will be so far removed from what's happening in a faraway place that they have no concern. They're there to feed their families. And they are, they're, they're there to get a paycheck. We need to bring the awareness of what's happening to the arms, what's happening to the components going across the assembly, the assembly lines in front of them. Bring that awareness in class terms to those workers. Those workers know what it means when they see images of civilian parents holding their lifeless children in their arms, the agony on their face. You have no interest in producing arms that lead to that result. You have no interest in enriching a small minority of imperialists who are holding down Israel as they're an extension of their military power so that they can secure geopolitical influence in that region, uh, access to oil resources. You have no interest in propping that up and you have the power to stop it. Together, we have that power. If we had a systematic campaign bringing these class issues into the workplace, look at the Boeing workers, a company that is squeezing the workers so badly that you now have planes falling apart in the skies because they're cutting corners. The workers want to fight against their exploitation. Boeing is also surely producing some of these components that are going to fund Israel. We can bring these class issues together. You need communists to do that. You need people who understand things in class war terms to do that. We need to organize communist cells in those workplaces. 
This is the kind of coordination that's needed. This is the reason that you need a mass communist party, hundreds of cells, of trained militants, of agitators, of propagandists, to bring this message to the shop floor across the country. This is what the Revolutionary Communists of America is attempting to do. We're trying to respond to this moment with a very, it's a very difficult task. It's not going to be easy to build a mass communist party, but we know that we have behind us an entire generation, millions of young people who have had it with capitalism, who are ready to fight, who are ready to take action, who want to bring these horrors of imperialism to an end. We have the numbers. We need organization. That is what's needed. If you want to help carry this message into the movement, do it in an organized way with the Revolutionary Communists of America. We have the forces to make the Intifada more than just a slogan. We can make this a reality in our lifetime and we can bring about the end of imperialism. The working class has that power. Let's make that a reality. That was Antonio Bomer. Now we're going to hear from Bryce Gordon and Tom Trottier, who are going to give us some background to this movement and give a little bit more insight as to what communists should be thinking right now and how communists can intervene in the way that Antonio just outlined for us. So first, Tom is going to give a little background to the war currently happening and the class nature of that war. Just to quickly go over the what are the roots of this, of this struggle, um, we have to remember that um, we live in what we call the period of imperialism. Uh, per- imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism, right? And what is imperialism? Imperialism is when you have the domination of monopoly capital. And in these advanced capitalist imperialist countries, they have enormous investments going all around the world. And so they have an intricate military and political system to maintain that worldwide rule so that they can basically, um, you know, uh, profit, take, you know, enormous profits from the whole entire uh, uh, globe. And this has been going on, of course, you know, for more than 100 years. But if you take a look, for example, at the Middle East in particular, the Middle East is a very strategic part of the world. It's militarily strategic. It's strategic in terms of world trade. And it also has a lot of oil, which is, of course, very, very important to the capitalist economy. So from the military, political, strategic point of view, the United States, particularly after World War II, when it became the the largest and most powerful world imperialist power, which it continues to be the largest and most uh, uh, powerful world imperialist power today, it wanted to make sure that it had control over that region. So one of the things they did was they utilized the opportunities after World War II, where you had enormous amount of Jewish refugees caused by the Nazi genocide in Europe. And um, the United States used this this, uh, movement of Zionism as a way to create the Israeli Zionist state. They took a a place which had been home to two different people. And they basically said, we're going to support one one group to to take over that area. Um, And of course, they they had a, a criminal partition of that area. And then they supported the Zionists in their, in their uh, goal to expand, um, which Israel, since it started, has just been expanding, expanding. Um, and um, the United, the, we, I think we could clearly say that without U.S. imperialism, Zionism wouldn't exist. And of course, through all those decades, since the late 1940s, um, the Zionist state of Israel continues to get aid from the U.S. imperialism, including the latest congressional aid uh, that Biden uh, is, is signing off on, uh, where, where, you know, uh, additional money for arms and, and ammunition is going to the Zionist state. So the Zionist state, in oppressing and taking away a homeland for the Palestinian people, has caused enormous suffering, enormous problems. And this, of course, as a byproduct of this oppression, as a, as a, as a byproduct of denying the Palestinians a right to a homeland, um, this has created constant struggle, constant wars. And of course, the latest war on Gaza is just the the latest installment of what has been a tragedy since the late 1940s. Right. And U.S. imperialism sees Israel correctly as its only remaining reliable ally in the region. And so the interesting thing about this is um, the U.S. imperialists are aware that their backing for this horrific war is destabilizing 
uh, both the Middle East, but also domestically. It's causing um, unprecedented rejection of the two party, of both parties, of lesser evil voting and all of these things. And so um, <clears throat> there's, there's, I mean, as people have seen all of the horrific images uh, week after week, month after month, the last, uh, since, since October, people see that 34,000 people have been killed in Gaza. Over a million have been displaced. Uh, and it's, it's turning people against this policy. But U.S. imperialism has to keep funding Israel uh, by virtue of its fundamental class interests. And, and so, um, I mean, also, too, there was a Gallup poll a few weeks ago, which actually showed that for the first time, a majority of Americans now disapprove of Israel's actions, which is up significantly since the beginning of the war, I think by around 20 percentage points. And so um, it's, it's, it's exposed U.S. capitalism. It's exposed Biden and the Democrats. Uh, and of course, the Republicans would be pursuing the exact same policy uh, if they were in power. And it's clear that Biden is worried about this uh, phenomenon, this uh, this this erod- erosion of his support. He's been giving uh, a bit more cynical lip service to the need for humanitarian aid and the need for a ceasefire and these kinds of things. And yet, uh, just you know, behind these uh, rhetorical statements, the Senate just passed a measure to send 17 billion in military aid to Israel, which is a huge amount. I mean, the U.S. sends about 3 billion each year, uh, but they're going to really replenish Israel's uh, stockpiles. Biden is, of course, expect he's, he's going to uh, okay this, of course. Um, and at the same time, Israel's war aims have still not been achieved. And so the U.S. has to keep greenlighting this genocide, this uh, savage imperialist war, but it's opening up a real uh, rift in U.S. society. I think this experience is dispelling illusions in the Democrats, but also just in the idea that through merely demonstrating that we can end uh, a war like this, it's becoming increasingly clear that there is no democracy around these kinds of fundamental questions for U.S. capitalism. Uh, And I think basically what we see now with the student occupations is that a layer of student activists are realizing that. They're drawing a balance sheet of the past seven months, all the demonstrations and rallies that have happened in hundreds of cities across the country. And they realize that that they're realizing that that hasn't made a real impact. Would you agree with that? Yeah, well, you're seeing that the needs and and interests of US imperialism is to maintain Israel and to support them in this vicious war. And yet, uh, by doing this, um, it's it's awakening large segments of the American working class, large segments of the American youth, to what's going on, the horrors of what's going on. And they're saying that the U.S. government and the U.S. Uh, 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 imperialism is doing these things. Um, and and, and uh, they're doing it, of course, with the taxpayer money, the taxes that they raise from the working class and from the, uh, from the people in this country. And uh, people are saying, we don't want to be part of that. We don't want to be on the side of the oppressor. We don't want to see these people being massacred. I think it's over the, the death count now in Gaza is over 33,000. It may, may have gone up uh, since I last saw it, but that, that I believe it's, it's something like that. Um, and, pe- and people are horrified with the way with, with what the government is doing. So that helps to create a contradiction and people start to realize, is that government something that we control or is it something that functions on its own? And people start to realize that what what is called a democratic system, where supposedly you have the rule of the people and a rule of the majority, it's not really that, right? The really the government, the really the government is really ruled by these super rich people, the capitalist class, right? The richest one, two, three percent. They're the people who really run the government. And the government runs in their interest, not in the interest of the majority of the people. So as those contradictions occur, people start um, becoming aware that that government is not representing them and that therefore not only what it's doing in Israel, but maybe even what it's doing in terms of their own domestic lives, they see a a contradiction arise. And out of that, people are starting to get outrage. They're starting to fight back. And this is what you're seeing on the campuses with, with the youth. I mean, it is remarkable, for example, that in spite of all the propaganda for decades in the United States, which tries to paint the picture of Israel as being the victim somehow, 
in fact they are they are, the, the zionist state is the the oppressor you know it's it's the it's the uh the the proxy of, of u.s imperialism but they've they've they in, in domestically they've tried to paint it as a victim and people are becoming aware that no it's not the victim it's it's the cause of the problem it's not the it's not the uh the the result of of some uh, other oppressive force attacking them, you know, and 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 as as people become more and more aware of that, people are, get outraged by that, and they start to fight back. And this is exactly what you've seen: this change in the public opinion in the United States, where where people have realized that they that they're not going to support Israel anymore, they're not going to support U.S. government support of Israel. You've seen the growth in protests, and then of course the most recent protests that have uh, 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 that have taken place on a number of campuses, um, which uh, which is you know started at Columbia University, but seem to be spreading to many many campuses around the country. Yeah, they're looking for uh, basically they want to escalate it. They want to make a real dent in Israel's war effort. I think that's what's behind the demand to for the universities to divest uh, from companies that work with Israel. People are realizing well demonstrations. We've we've voiced ourselves as loudly as we possibly could. That's not changing a thing. How do we actually materially impact Israel's war effort and actually bring the war to a close? And so they're um, looking uh, to that demand and also to the tactic of occupation instead of uh, mere rallies and demonstrations, which I think we can speak on in in just a bit. <clears throat> but we should state just for the listener uh, to, again, catch everyone up to speed. As you said, uh, last Thursday, a week ago, this started, or I think actually last Wednesday, Eight days ago, this started at Columbia University. A group of students started uh, basically occupying a section of the campus, uh, putting forth this demand to divest. It's quickly spread the campuses across the country, the places like Yale, Harvard, Emerson College, University of Texas, University of Southern California, University of Minneapolis. And we have comrades on the ground participating uh, and bringing communist ideas to uh, many of these protests. And so it's, it's very significant to see the movement is picking up yet again, uh, despite all the media slander, of course, um, Biden has predictably slandered this movement as being anti-Semitic. Um, Greg Abbott, the same, and he actually, um, you know, speaking of democratic rights being violated, basically said that anyone participating in these protests should just go to jail, should be, should not even have the right to participate in these protests. So. The, uh, the veneer of democracy is being discarded in, in some cases. Here's another example of what the ruling class is saying. Mike Johnson, the current Speaker of the House, visited Columbia during this encampment and was met with chants and booing while he tried to spin this as some sort of anti-Semitic protest. The, the, the founders and, and the, the great leaders who had come through this institution in the past believed in religious liberty, they believed in democracy, they believed in morality and virtue and the dignity of every human person. They believed in the free exchange of ideas and they detested mob rule. To the bourgeois class, even peaceful protests that express the demands of the masses are labeled mob rule. And shamefully, some professors and faculty have joined the mobs. As Columbia has allowed these lawless agitators and radicals to take over, the virus of anti-Semitism has spread across other campuses. By some counts, as many as 200 universities have a similar form of protest right now. We should be entirely clear and restate the fact that this movement has nothing to do with anti-Semitism. The reason why these students have shown out in such a force is because of the indignation that they feel seeing thousands and thousands of people being murdered. We just recently found out that over 400 people were found in mass graves in Gaza at hospitals. Some of the bodies were found with their hands zip tied behind their backs and indications that people were buried alive. This is what people are upset about. To try to characterize this as anti-Semitism is a disgusting use of identity politics by the ruling class so that they don't have to acknowledge the real reason why people have shown out in this way. Um, but it's not just these student 
encampments that are happening. There's also um, employees at Google. 28 employees were fired because they were attempting to occupy an office in protest of their employer's um, cloud computing contract with Israel. There's been continued demonstrations. There were demonstrators at uh, in Scranton, Pennsylvania, during Biden's visit there the last week. And there's clearly widespread support for the movement, too. Uh, for instance, three quarters of Columbia students support the call to divest from companies that do business with Israel. And so this really has spread across the country. On the topic of occupations and the role students can and must play in this movement generally, I think if we look at history, we see that students can absolutely play a catalyst role for movements in certain contexts. Um, and in any case, students often serve as a barometer of the mood in society. But the thing is, is that their position in society doesn't allow them to seriously tackle capitalism. In order to do that, you would need to link up with the working class, which absolutely does have the role in production, the role in society, which by virtue of withholding its labor can shut down capitalism. And, and so I think as communists, when we participate in these movements, um, another emphasis we'd be make, making is that we need to broaden out the scope of the movement, expand, link up with the staff workers, with the faculty, with the workers in nearby industries, uh, and, and, and explain that through united action of the working class, uh, it, it, it is possible to shut down the war machine, to shut down U.S. imperialism. We'll be right back with the conversation between Tom and Bryce. But we wanted to switch to a different segment real quick to look more at the topic of how workers can actually end the imperialist war machine. So we have a comrade, Abedi Ludlam, who recently did a bunch of research about weapons manufacturing. And she wrote an article called, How Can We Actually Stop Imperialism's Genocidal Slaughter? And that's going to be included in issue number two of The Communist, which is currently going to print. The U.S. is by far... Israel's largest source of weapons. They provide 68% of all of Israel's arms imports. The U.S. gives $3.8 billion in military aid to Israel every year, and the majority of that goes to purchasing American-made weapons. Um, and actually, just since the beginning of the war in Gaza, the U.S. has approved over 100 military sales to Israel. And all of these weapons are produced in the U.S. by a massive network of millions of workers across the entire country. Just as one example of what that network actually looks like um, is in the production of the F-35 fighter jets. The Biden administration recently approved the sale of 25 of these jets to Israel. This is one of the most advanced military planes in the world. Um, and these, these jets are assembled by Lockheed Martin in their facility in Fort Worth, Texas. At this facility, there are over 18,000 workers working on the assembly of these jets. But then beyond those 18,000 workers is an even broader network of people who are producing the raw materials, who are uh, producing the parts that go into the jets, and who are transporting all of these raw materials and parts and transporting the final product to, to the ports. Um, so in total, there is a network of 240,000 workers across 47 states who are all um, taking part in producing just this single weapon that is, uh, is being sent from the U.S. to Israel. Um, and of course, beyond those 240,000 workers are, are, are hundreds of thousands, millions more who are producing the rest of the weapons that go to Israel, who are producing the raw materials, the parts, uh, and who are transporting these parts and, and the final product. Um, and what would really be necessary to shut down the flow of weapons from the U.S. to Israel would be a national coordinated strike across this entire industry encompassing millions of people. Um, and and what, what would really be needed in order to do that would be uh, coordination and it would also be political uh, leadership. It would be people who understand what needs to happen, people who understand the power of the working class, the fact that the capitalists are not going to shut down this production voluntarily, and who can communicate to their, to their coworkers that they have the power to shut down production, that they share a common enemy 
with the Palestinian people that the same bosses who are exploiting them every day in their in their workplaces are profiting off of the genocide of Palestinians. In short, basically what, what would be needed would be communist cells in every single workplace putting forward these ideas um, and, and, and for these cells to be linked up to each other in a communist party. Um, and so that's why we are building a communist party in the U.S. That's why we need a communist party to actually shut down the flow of production to Israel. And that's why the student occupations need to uh, broaden out and connect to those workers who are uh, who are a part of the, the production of these weapons in order to actually uh, shut down U.S. imperialism and, uh, and, and the flow of weapons from the U.S. to Israel. I think a lot of people... Having seen this, uh, again, this U.S.-backed genocidal war on Gaza over the past few months, they've come to realize that we need an entirely new system. They've become communists. They've become revolutionaries. What should their task be? What what should their political priority be over the next period? Um, And what can we expect from the next period in U.S. politics? Because it's clear the war isn't ending tomorrow. Meanwhile, we have a general election here in the U.S., which is two previous presidents uh, rematching. And so the whole situation is is pretty unprecedented. We have the DNC coming up in August, uh, and it looks like there's going to be uh, a a large march on the DNC to protest Joe Biden's complicity in the war on Gaza. And so all in all, we're entering an extremely unstable period, it looks like. I mean, Speaking of campus occupations, I don't think it's been since the Vietnam War that we saw student occupations at this scale in the United States. Um, so what, what should be the task of communists? What should be the priority of communists in the coming period to fight to overthrow capitalism and to, to fight for the cause of the Palestinians? Well, the communists are part, have been part of this movement from the beginning. We're part of it now, and we're going to continue to be part of it. But what role are we playing? We're, we're, we're playing this very, very important role. We've got to get the message out that we need to build a party. We need to build a communist party that eventually becomes a mass party. Because if we want to get to a workers' government, if we want to end the rule of capitalism, end the dictatorship of a few people over the vast majority, if we want to do that, you need a party. The working class is enormous in this country. It's a very, you know, it's the majority of the vast majority of the population is either working class or part of the working class families. But in order to take uh, power, in order to transform society and end the dictatorship of the few rich people over the majority, in order to do that, it has to be mobilized and organized correctly. And that takes a mass party. So the most serious and dedicated of the youth have to join this effort to build a mass communist party right now. If we built the mass communist party, then we can end all the horrors of capitalism here and abroad. And the bigger the movement gets here in the United States, the bigger the communist movement gets in the United States, the more it will be a, uh, a, a, a basically a star leading the rest of the, the masses around the world because they're going to look at the, the, the U.S. imperialist monster in its own homeland. The people are starting to rise up. The workers are starting to rise up and overthrow this monster here. And uh, there's nothing... <laughs> that we can do more to help the movement abroad than to help to build the communist party, the communist movement here in, in the uh, belly of the beast, so to speak. You know, to, to all the listeners out there, um, even if you're not convinced or in full agreement with everything we had to say, if you think what we're saying makes a lot of sense, um, please reach out to us, uh, uh, you know, uh, contact the Revolutionary Communists of America. We'd love to sit down and discuss this with you about how we can help to build a real party that will be a real tool for real liberation here and abroad. So what are the communists doing right now? Well, to answer this question, we actually have a few recordings from comrades on the ground. The first two will be in New York, starting with a speech that a comrade did at the Columbia protests. This is Comrade Abit doing a speech right in the heat of things. You know, 56 years ago, at this very university, there was encampments against the Vietnam War, where the students courageously held these encampments. And today, 
you have to do the exact same thing. And instead of the bureaucracy talking to them peacefully, they call the NYPD to not only assault them, but even suspend these students. Shame! Shame! These are the same students, by the way, who pay the salaries of every single administrator inside. And the hypocrisy of this bureaucracy has been shown because everyone remembers a few months ago where Zionists used a chemical weapon against the pro-Palestinians inside. So what this has shown to everyone, not just here, not just in USC, but the entire country, is that every single bureaucracy is not on the side of the students, but on the side of the, of the Zionists who are literally killing thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Palestinians day in and day out while profiting off this genocide. This isn't just the bureaucracy of the universities. This is also the Democrats and Republicans, including Eric Adams. Yeah. And what this has shown to everyone, not just here but globally, is every ruling class party is not on the side of the workers. Not Joe Biden, who's by the way signed over a hundred arm deals to fund the genocide. Not Donald Trump. Not a single Democrat, not a single Republican will stop this genocide. That's because U.S. imperialism is the largest backer of Israeli imperialism. Shame! Shame! So Colombia, yes, must divest from Israeli companies. But also, what needs to be done to end this genocide is like we've been saying for hours on end, is one solution, revolution. And in order to have that, we must globalize the Intifada. Students in there have shown the courage. The, the dock workers in India and Italy have shown the courage by saying no more arms being sent to Israel, no more funds being sent to Israel. We must have workers' power, students' power, through unity. And to liberate Palestine, capitalism must be overthrown, not just here, but globally as well. What we need, not just here, but globally, is a working class party, is ultimately a revolutionary communist party who's saying no more Democrats, no Republicans, no more the bureaucracy of Colombia has been profiting of the genocide. A party that's for the workers that must say no more genocide, no more profiting off any war, and actually throwing cap in the dustbin of history and saying liberation to the workers, liberation to Palestine, liberation to the world. Woo! Our comrades have been engaging in speeches just like this all over the country with a similar reception. Whenever you connect the movement that's currently going on to the bigger picture, how can students actually play a role in defeating US imperialism? That is something that people don't usually get to hear. That's not a perspective that is commonly outlined. But we don't just do speeches at protests. We also have organized walkouts in New York as well, not just in New York, but this is a comrade from Pace University who is gonna tell us a little bit about their walkout. We took it upon ourselves to host this walkout because 30,000 Palestinians had died um, in the hands of the state of Israel and US and world imperialism. And Netanyahu had refused to cease fire repeatedly and threatened a ground invasion on Rafah um, where around two million people are stuck. And students are already aware of these facts. They're enraged by these facts, and they're motivated to take actual action, but there's no real leadership worthy for them. So we understood that we had to take immediate responsibility to put forward bolder and more concrete demands and logical class war conclusions. On top of this, there had been no pro-Palestine activism on campus because nobody was bold enough to do such a thing, even when the majority of the student body was ready to protest. And private universities even uh, that do have pro-Palestinian activism are threatened by the uh, Zionist capitalists who fund them because they threaten to pull educational funding if students and faculty stand against the brutal colonization and genocide. So that's when we realized it was really our duty to set forth these demands that are bolder than a ceasefire to bring to light this fact that in order to end the genocide and the U.S. imperialism responsible for it, we need to have a communist revolution and a workers' government. And in order to have this freedom of a speech and freedom to assemble against this genocide, we must expropriate these schools from the capitalists who are profiting from the genocide and paying for our silence. We stood in every single street corner, on top of every table in the school and in the academic buildings, to reach this vast layer of students who are already looking for a serious organization with serious plans to agitate and take a stance at our school. And this brought in countless students 
just because of our presence being so bold, um, and some of which who are now our comrades dedicated to the revolution. And we had a lot of branches dedicated to teaching our aims as communists and how communists can end this genocide. And for instance, like what an intifada looks like, what it is. We made leaflets. We handed them out with our demands while we were giving these agitational speech. And it set forward really our plans for the rally and our plans for the future. The rally itself turned out amazing, um, and it really showed the RCA's strength, not only in being bold and ready to fight, but being strong and logical in theory and conclusions about how the working class is the only one able to end this genocide through class struggle. Uh, students, faculty members, and others who had just heard about the event started to come to the rally and chant with us, and the moods of everyone there were completely militant and revolutionary. Every single protester eventually shouted proudly that the only solution is a communist revolution. And yet, as the rally went on, one thing that really helped was the backlash we got. The dean of students, for instance, uh, he threatened to have NYPD make an arrest on us for using a megaphone. Instead of being fearful of this threat, we used it to our advantage. We politicized it. We got these protesters more radicalized against our school. That day was the day that I think our PACE comrades really realized what the RCA's newer tasks are and what our work is going to really look like from this point on. We're going to be the, organize, um, the organizers, the organization under which the workers and students can, can band together to pave the way for a proletarian revolution, the revolution that's necessary to see the end of this genocide and all forms of barbarism. And of course, we haven't just been involved in this episode of the Palestine Solidarity Movement. We've been doing things for the last few months, and not just in New York either. We had a rally in Minneapolis. You can find videos of this on their Instagram, which I will link in the show notes, but it's pretty awesome to see. You see communists marching with a car at the front with the comrade, with the loudspeaker, chanting these slogans. It's also not just speeches and chanting that we're doing. We're actually trying to talk to people about what's happening in Palestine and connecting that to U.S. imperialism and capitalism and the need for a communist party in America. We've been doing this uh, in agitational campaigns just like this one. Our comrades were doing agitation on the New York City train. Sorry to bother you on your Friday evening, but this week, a young 25-year-old man, Aaron Bushnell, lit himself on fire in front of the Israeli embassy to protest the ongoing genocide in Gaza, where now the death toll of women and children is approaching 30,000. Yesterday, 100 people were injured or killed trying to get food, necessary aid that they needed. The ruling class is unwilling to lift a finger. What we need to do to combat imperialism is organize the working class. This isn't an issue that can be solved with voting. There's no change that can happen in this country with voting. We are the revolutionary communists of America, and we are organizing a party that is up to the task of fighting imperialism and putting an end to the genocide in Gaza once and for all. We are living in a revolutionary epoch. This episode of the Palestine Solidarity Movement is an example of that. Capitalism is continuing to remind us that we're in a era of dramatic reawakening of the class struggle. This is the largest student occupation movement in the United States since the Vietnam War broke out. And we really have to understand the significance of that. If you are trying to get organized, if you agree with us, if you agree with our perspective, or you want to talk to us about it, then you should reach out to us and get organized if you're not organized. There will be links in the description as to how you can do that. If you want to educate yourself, you want to learn what's happening, become, get updated. We published an article earlier this week called Palestine Solidarity Protests Escalate in Face of Campus Repression. And we also have a few articles in the most recent issue of The Communist. And of course, other episodes of the podcast are good for that as well. And again, the best thing you can do is reach out to get organized right now and actually join the fight to see a free Palestine 
in our lifetime and the end of U.S. imperialism and the end of capitalism. Join the Revolutionary Communists of America and join the fight for communism.